This is Patrick Russell. I'm interviewing William Montgomery for the first time. This interview is taking place at Lutz, Florida. Lutz, yeah. Lutz Florida on uh, April the 24th, 2015. This interview is being conducted by the Making History Project. Um, let's start with uh, when were you born? Uh, March 23rd, 1926. And where were you born? In Greenville, South Carolina. We didn't live there long. I think mom was just passing through, but we did live there a short time. Okay, and where did you grow up? Most of, mostly in Florida. What part? From, uh, well, uh, Leesburg, Orlando, and Jacksonville. The last six years were in Jacksonville. Um, we moved from Jacksonville about a week after Pearl Harbor. Moved to, to, to New Jersey, Maplewood, New Jersey. My father was transferred up there. All right. What did your father do? He was, he was a in life insurance company uh, manager while I knew him. And uh, he, was, he, was, he was, we moved around a lot. And how? He, uh, uh, we lived in Richmond, Virginia the last several years of his life, and he died at 48. And how big was your family? Pardon me? How big was your family? Sister is uh, five and a half years younger than I am. Had a brother who was about 15 years younger. Died at age 30, I don't know, 29. An accident in Washington, D.C. And what were you doing before the war? I was going to high school. Uh, I was secretly wishing the war would not be over before I could uh, become 18 and uh, finish high school and join the Marine Corps. And how old were you in 1941, in December? I was three months shy of my 16th birthday. Okay. And you already were thinking about the Marine Corps? I, I wanted, at first, early in the war, including the war in Europe, first, I wanted to be a, a, a fighter pilot in the Air Corps. My uncle, mother's youngest brother, who was three and a half years older than I, uh, joined the Marine Corps and was, he was a, a member of a, a two, two crew member torpedo bomber in the Marine Corps. I was shot down in the South Pacific. Never, never heard of him, wreckage or anything. Uh, therefore, I wanted to fight the Japs uh, for, for Collins. Collins was his name. He was my buddy. And did you ultimately enlist? Yeah. Okay. And when was that? I, uh, I, I went through, when I was 18, I was in the last month or so of high school. I went through the selective service, had my physical exam, tests, and passed and volunteered for the Marine Corps. I asked for a deferment, see I was in March, April, for, for about two and a half months, graduated uh, from about, about the June, the, the day after high school graduation, which is early in June. Uh, the day after graduation, I went down to the Marine Corps recruiting office and asked them to hurry up with my orders to report for duty. They were happy to oblige. Uh, two days later, I was sworn into the U.S. Marine Corps. That same day, I caught a train for San Diego, California, boot camp. So moved, things moved pretty fast, yep. and that's what I wanted. And how did your uh, family feel about you joining the Marine Corps? Of course, they were, they were apprehensive. My mother had lost her youngest brother, but it was inevitable. And uh, they, they did not want me to run to Canada, of course, like so many Vietnam era young men were encouraged to do. So they accepted it, and I think we're proud that I wanted to follow my uncle Collins' footsteps in the Marine Corps. And in the Marine Corps, what was your highest rank? PFC. 
And do you recall when you actually entered into the service, the date? It was, it was, it was June, the, June the 6th, 1944, as I said, right after high school graduation. And so that was on D-Day. Pardon me? That turned out to be D-Day. Exactly, exactly. So they had the headlines. Me joining Marine Corps wasn't a big headline. <laughs> And um, where was basic training? Uh, San Diego, boot camp. The two boot camps, Marine Corps, pa Paris Island, San Diego. They shipped me to San Diego. And tell me a little bit about that experience. Well, it's, it's been, many stories have been written about that. It, it, it was tough. Uh, uh, they wanted to be, they were trained to be mean to us. Not abusive, but mean. Uh, we spent we spent about three weeks, most of our training was on the rifle range. They expected every Marine in boot camp to qualify for, uh, with the rifle, M1 rifle, Garand M1. Uh, I wanted to, to qualify as an expert, which is the highest score, uh, so I could um, apply for um, scout and sniper school. But I did, and I got in scout and sniper school. And what made you want to get into scout and sniper school? I've often wondered why uh, I did, but it was uh, uh, it was it was purported and and it was recorded and uh, written to be the, the, about the toughest, uh, most dangerous uh, specialty in the Marine Corps. That's what I wanted. Being 18, I didn't know any better. And then ultimately, did you become a sniper? I, w I, w I, was, uh, I was assigned to the uh, battalion intelligence unit, which did a lot of things. Sniping was one of them, and scouting, mainly scouting. So uh, at Thanksgiving, when I landed in Hawaii from, from San Diego after all the training, uh, uh, I was assigned to a battalion intelligence unit and then assigned to a, in that unit, assigned to a three-man forward observer post. We observe the enemy, I suppose, and pick up whatever intelligence uh, needed, but mainly serve as a rifleman. And how is the training as a forward observer, scout, sniper different than your basic training? Well, after basic training, I went to a scout sniper school way up in the mountains east of San Diego, up in the mountain area. That was uh, a couple of months. Uh, they taught scouting, uh, compass uh, use, map reading. Uh, we'd had our, our rifle training, pretty much. But primarily it was scouting. And uh, as I said, uh, map reading, uh, locating your position, and generally uh, scout intelligence work. And how long was your training? Scout sniper school was about about two and a half months, as I recall. After that, it was uh, Camp Pendleton for a little more infantry training, and then aboard ship. And where did you go from there? Went uh, 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 probably uh, ten days, week or ten days before Thanksgiving. We boarded ship in San Diego and uh, landed uh, in Hawaii and went over to the Big Island. Uh, on Thanksgiving Day, uh, they told us to pack up and we're going to be assigned to the Fifth Fifth Marine Division. Uh, we got all ready for it. We, we thought they were going to feed us Thanksgiving dinner because the, the, the order was wafting our way in. We were looking forward to it. Instead, they told us to pack up, get in the trucks, and board a little dinky ship offshore, which is an inner island steamer, and, uh, and went over to the, joined the 5th Marine Division on the Big Island. And what was ultimately your unit? I was in the 2nd uh, Battalion, as I mentioned, 
26 Marines, 26 Regiment, 5th Marine Division. And the, the unit, as, as I said, was the, uh, initially was the forward observer. That was, that was uh, uh, my job the first five days on Iwo Jima. And did you, in fact, deploy overseas? Did I deploy overseas? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, where'd you go? Well, as I said, I went to Hawaii, then joined the 5th Division, and early in, in January, about the middle of January, we boarded ships bound for a new combat operation. We didn't know where, but after a couple of days at sea, they broke out the relief maps and advised us we were going to, going to take a small island 700 miles from uh, Japan called Iwo Jima, and we should, we should finish up in about three days. Little did they know then. And what did they tell you about Iwo Jima, besides three days? What else did they tell you about it? Before we landed? Yes. It was uh, supposed to be well fortified, but it was, being, it was being blasted for weeks by the Air Corps and, and some uh, battleships and cruisers offshore. And supposedly it knocked out all the big guns and many of the defending troops. Uh, it didn't, that wasn't true, of course. Did they give you any indication as to the amount of forces you would be facing? The number of people, we knew, um, uh, we knew the entire 5th Division, which is, you know, three regiments and so on, was going. Uh, I'm not sure if they advised us the 4th Division, their full complement was to join the landing. And uh, the third division was to be in reserve offshore until needed. Uh, I think D plus four, they had to call the third division, two regiments of the third division in. And uh, they were in the battle the rest of the operation. They took proportionally uh, as many casualties as, uh, as, as fourth and fifth division did. And prior to landing on Iwo Jima, did they tell you the amount of enemy troops that you would face or, or expected? No. They had no idea? They knew it was well fortified. They didn't know that it was going to be over 20,000 troops there. That was a surprise? Yeah. And what did you do to prepare for a... Um, island invasion? Well, we had, uh, we had practiced uh, dry runs on uh, boat landing. Uh, we would practiced uh, not on a ship, but ladder, the, uh, the rope ladder is going off the ship that you jump in the... But I guess the real, the first time I went, off, uh, I went down a rope ladder, I guess it was practice, was off we left Hawaii, was off um, offshore on any we talk, which is an island the Marines took six months earlier, a small island in the Pacific. And uh, they, they, they thought, and we were going from there up to Iwo Jima. And the, the captain or the Marine commander thought the Marines would enjoy a swim. So he lowered a couple of boats and put a couple of sailors in each boat with submachine guns. They were for sharks in case uh, they bothered us. They didn't bother us, but those who wanted to jump overboard and have a little swim, I was one of them, did so. And they pulled, and we came back up uh, the rope ladder. First time I've been up a rope ladder on a ship. All right, what about training for actually landing on a beach, storming a hill, jungle warfare? Uh, that, that was in the uh, scout sniper school primarily, and, and some in boot camp. So some of that you already were prepared for? Yeah. Okay. If, you know, there's a lot of, not a lot of time. Things were, uh, they lost a lot of Marine Corps, lost a lot of men, and they were trying to re replete uh, uh, the ranks. And uh, that's why I was a replacement before we went aboard ship replacement to fill out openings in the 5th Marine Division. 
So we're ready to go. And were you involved in combat on Iwo Jima? Yeah, 37 days. From, from D-Day, which is the landing day, uh, 37th day later we uh, left. There weren't many of us. Very few of the original landing troops uh, went back aboard the ship. And, you know, unhurt. The and, and many of it had been hit, but not enough to uh, stay in Miss Sick Bay or be shipped off to uh, more treatment. Tell me how you felt and what you were doing the day before you knew you were going to go on that island. The day before we were supposed to land, um, surprisingly, uh, many of us, I don't know that I did or not, many of us uh, played pinochle on deck up until we were called aboard the boats. <laughs> but most of the time was uh, briefing uh, by each unit. They didn't know much about Iwo Jima anyway. Uh, just rely on the training that we'd had and uh, many, many uh, stories and lectures about the previous landings uh, in the Pacific by the Marines and by the Army. Philippines was well underway, so the Army and the Marine Corps had uh, many landings in the various campaigns before Iwo Jima. Do Marines get nervous before an invasion? Of course. Yeah. It was getting a little, little apprehensive because it, it was, the casualty and death was much, much greater than anticipated. But of course we knew, no matter how light the uh, resistance was, we knew that the number would be killed. Certainly not what the actual were killed. Take me through D-Day. How did it start and how did it go down? Yeah. Well, we, we, probably the smartest general, Japanese general in the uh, Japanese army was General Kurbayashi, uh, who commanded uh, Iwo Jima force. All the previous landings, when the Marines came ashore, they banzai and, and tried to keep them off the beaches. He knew he couldn't prevent the Marines from coming to shore, uh, so he held back much of his firepower. Many men were killed in the first few waves, uh, but their heavy firepower was held about uh, held off until about noon. Our battalion didn't go ashore until about noon, and just when things were really really heating up. And uh, from that point on, it was a grind. When, 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 the, when we cut a, went ashore, the 26th and 27th Marines cut straight across as, along with the 20, 28th Marines. When we got to the other side, which is 800, 800 yards across, the 28th Marines cut left and started up the mountain. The 28th Marines were the ones that raised the flags, you know, uh, four days later. Uh, the 26th and 27th Marines turned right and went to push on the left side of the island all the way for the, till the end of it. And uh, the, uh, as you probably know in, in, in the, uh, on the flag raising stories, uh, the, the, the six who raised the flag was really the second flag. It wasn't, wasn't planned that way, but they wanted to replace the flag. Three of the six uh, well-known uh, Marines that raised the second flag, the picture, the, the, the iconic picture, three of them died within the next two or three weeks. That's, that's when really the vicious, uh, deadly fighting continued, continued for probably until um, uh, the 20th or so of March. Many men were killed after the point, but, uh, but most of the 
heavy artillery from the Japanese had been knocked out. Uh, a number of the mortars were still in effective. Uh, they had plenty of ammunition. They were good shots, the Japanese. Many more men were killed, machine gun, rifle fire, mortar fire. But the big artillery was, by and large, quieted down. And what did you personally see on D-Day? Tell me about what you did. First thing I saw, I don't know if I've ever told you this, but we came ashore, as I said, close to noon. It was, it was pretty getting pretty hot by then. Up a little bit up on the beach, uh, I saw the first dead Marine. There were a number of them, but this one was kneeling in a little hole. Uh, had his rifle pointed, but he had no head. Clean, clean off. Uh, a big shell must have landed right in front of him, blew his head off. So that was kind of a little bit of a shock, uh, but it was quick, quick. Uh, had to face reality pretty quickly by seeing that. And there were many things any events even worse than that I've seen in the subsequent days. All kind of mutilation, all kind of death caused that nobody's talking about in detail. See. Were you ever injured? Never was. I was one of the very few that, that was on there since D-Day to the very end, uh, it, it was never hit. People right next to me were hit, but I was never hit. And somehow after a while, because of that, I felt guilty. Everyone else was being hit, not just killed, but wounded. Why wasn't I? Uh, I think most of us, even the young guys, uh, developed a, a fatalistic attitude. We, we were convinced and accepted the fact that we were going to be hit. We just hoped it would not be fatal. So we accepted the fact we were going to get hit. And that took a lot of the pressure off. Being 18, I had my 19th birthday on Iwo Jima. But being that age, uh, I think there was less pressure because we were still kids. Uh, we had not seen life as some of the older fellows have seen. And uh, I think we were a little bit more, uh, less prone for uh, cracking up. You know, what cracking up means uh, a breakdown. And I, I saw a number of number. Most of the men I saw that were had cracked up uh, were the old guys. By old guys, I mean late twenties. And a number of times, several times, uh, I came across Marines sitting on the ground, uh, sobbing their heart out, shaking, and uh, just lost it. And I've, I've several times I've uh, took them by the arm, helped them up, and took them to the aid station, crying all the time. They were. Uh, talked to a corpsman, medical corpsman. They said, uh, people who crack up, you don't know how severe it was. It may have been, uh, may have been okay in a few days. Many of them expected to be months or a lifetime. Uh, problem with them, couldn't tell then. And that was one of the saddest part of uh, the, the casualty uh, experience. And uh, uh, even sadder in many ways of people that had mild injuries. It's the, um, the unseen injury. You can't see it. It's inside. We're going to get into that a little bit later. Yeah. Um, 
while you're on Iwo Jima for 37 days, tell me about some of the things that you were doing as a scout. You mean some of the, some of the combat experiences? Whatever you were asked to do and did. I, I'd say one of the, uh, uh, and I wrote about the events of a lot of this stuff in a little, little booklet I wrote uh, about 15 years ago. But I guess the, the, one of the most interesting was the day the flag was raised on Surabachi. That was, uh, I think, B plus, B plus four, fifth day, uh, the 23rd of March. We landed the 19th of, uh, 23rd of February. We landed the uh, 19th of, of February. The, my little observation post, uh, the sergeant, Sergeant Rasmussen, and two other fellows were, were on the, lying on an embankment <coughs> overlooking the second airfield wide open space there. Uh, we were getting ready to, what they call, jump off, move forward. The whole uh, regiment and division were in that position. To the right of us was a third Marine Division, two, uh, two, two, uh, two uh, regiments, which had just come ashore, were beginning to move out. And across the field, they were moving out, no protection, but dropping like, like flies. Uh, on the left, we're getting ready to jump off ourselves. I happened to see on, on, a, on a, a little cave opening about, must have been about uh, 500, five, 600 yards away. Uh, on a, in a cave entrance, I saw um, puffs of smoke coming out. Uh, I fired about two clips of ammunition into the hole and the puff, puffs of smoke stopped but I think we brought down a lot more fire on us because I had tracers in the, in the cliff. About every third round was a tracer. Of course, they could follow the, um, the source of it and even more in, the intensive fire we were under then we intensified even more, but that's, that's the way the game was. See. Uh, my sergeant, the three of us, my sergeant was hit. Uh, he, uh, he leaned over to me and says, uh, Monty, was anyone else hit? I said, no, you been hit? He said, uh, yeah, I think my ass is full of shrapnel. <laughs> uh, he stuck around a while, but he started bleeding pretty badly and uh, decided to take off to the aid station. Yeah, I didn't think he'd make it back. I forced him until he got out of sight. Shells were dropping all around him. The other guy got nicked and went to the aid station, so I was left alone there. And uh, we hadn't jumped off yet. Things were so intense. Uh, they had to cancel the movement that day. But about 10 o'clock, I, I, I looked backward to see a, a Surabachi. And um, curious on how the 28th Marines were doing with their push to the top. And the timing was pretty good because I could see the flag being raised there. Uh, other Marines saw it and started cheering. The ship's whistles offshore could see it, started blowing their whistles. And it was kind of a nice, nice uh, feeling because um, we knew that the highest point on the island would stop shooting at us. And probably it might be close to the end of the battle. Of course it wasn't. Uh, that was one kind of interesting experience. That, that, uh, Afternoon, late afternoon, I went back to the uh, battalion headquarters uh, to see what they wanted. You know, one man for reserve was not a very good position. It wasn't a good position to three. But they, they assigned me as the uh, intelligence scout to an easy company, E Company, of the 2nd Battalion. And uh, they needed me there because the man. I replaced the scout, the scout uh, intelligence scout for E Company. Had just been killed that morning, and I was with that position with E Company for the rest of the battle. Which means maps, uh, other functions, but mainly a rifleman. And uh, I was kind of with with the company commander, which at that time. Uh, was a young second lieutenant replacement 
all the other officers in the battalion, nearly all of them, yeah, 103 percent were, were casualties before the end of the battle. Young guy who I really, really admired, but I was didn't share, always share a foxhole with him, but it was in the area, and I kind of did what he told me, and then um, again served, served as a rifleman. Uh, so that, that that was it. The rest rest of the operation and and all another one which might be of interest. Another event was about two weeks into the battle, and you've heard all the stories about Jeff's infiltra infiltrating at night and so forth. Uh, our our company, which consisted at that time maybe 20, 25 men, the company usually has several hundred. Uh, were dug in in a, a little area about halfway up the island. Uh, I was on I was on uh, guard duty uh, in the company CP, but just a big hole, and all the other company were right around it. A little dirt road ran through the area, and when I about midnight or so, I was told to, I'm relieved of duty. Someone else would take over, go get some sleep. So I looked around and didn't find, I saw a little slick trench about uh, six feet long and about this wide and about only about this deep. So I lay down on the little slick trench. Right behind me, about two feet, was uh, two guys in a deep foxhole. Uh, again, this, this, close, this close to me. Not enough, not a big enough room for, not enough room for, for three. So I was tired, I, I dozed off to sleep. And then, I don't know how much later, maybe an hour or so, I uh, woke up. It really was thunder, firing and shooting all around and explosions. The guys behind me were firing all over my head at, the, at some japs. And about this far above my head, I couldn't raise up. I couldn't reach my rifle. Uh, some explosions hit pretty close right around my hole. So things quieted down and I went back to sleep. When you're tired, you go back to sleep any time. Uh, next morning, just about daybreak, I woke up. Uh, the guys behind me saw me raise up and they were astounded. They thought I was dead. They saw grenades, hand grenades, bouncing all around my hole, this close to the edge of the hole. They were sure I was dead. And, uh, I said, thanks a lot because you, you know, you're far, firing right over my head, this far from my, my, my face. Uh, a little more light uh, came up and uh, there were uh, several Japanese still uh, in holes, hiding in holes, alive. Uh, we approached them and some of them, if they had hand grenades, would toss hand grenades out. Uh, and they, uh, uh, some of them didn't have grenades, were hiding in little holes, to throw out rocks. They were kind of pathetic. But we, you know, at that stage, we, we had no sympathy for any of the Japs there. They were all, all disposed of. And then next morning, it's kind of interesting, um, a tank rolled up through our area, American tank, and it was a Japanese line parallel to the little road uh, holding two dead, holding two hand grenades in his hand. And the guy came up out of the uh, turret of the, the cannon and, and said, hey, hey, Matt, can you pull the dead chap out so we can get through? I said, I'm not touching them. Those grenades may be armed. If any movement, you might explode. So he closed the trap started the car and rolled right over the jet. When it, it passed, I looked at him, it hadn't exploded, of course, and I found a Japanese rifle underneath him. I picked it up, and about 65 years later, I gave it to his his son, my grandson. It was still in pretty good shape. Need, need, need a little work on it, but it's, it's in good condition now, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. Somehow I got it home. But Marines were souvenir hounds also. <laughs> but those are, those are one of many experiences which 
nearly everyone had that was in the uh, assault uh, area. Did you receive any awards or medals for your service? Not, not, not individually, just everybody received the presidential unit citation for the whole unit. And were you involved in any other campaigns after Iwo Jima? No, we went back, we went back, um, we, were, we were supposed to, we left about, um, I think the 28th of March. Uh, Okinawa landing was to be April 1st. We were originally scheduled to join them, but we didn't have anybody left. Uh, weren't prepared for any any kind of operation so they can replenish our ranks and a little more, little more training. So, but after the uh, uh, surrender, uh, after the, we heard about the, some super bombs being dropped and then three days later Nagasaki was hit and as you know, I think it was the 12th of August, they surrendered. Almost immediately we boarded ship and went to Japan right next to Nagasaki, which is the second bomb. And I stayed there nine months on occupation duty. And from there, uh, it was late in, in 46, we went home by way of Hawaii, Panama Canal, and Norfolk, Virginia, where I disembarked. And so how? I, I wasn't, a, I, I was fairly, a fairly short timer but pretty busy during that short time. How was occupation duty? You know, the first month or so it was interesting. We did a lot of patrolling since I was, that was my area in the, in the, uh, uh, the scout. Uh, but it got awfully dull after that. They uh, transferred to the second division. Everybody was just waiting to be uh, allowed to go home. And I, I left, as I said, nine months later. Uh, it was all over. Did you have any interaction with Japanese civilians during the occupation? No, uh, especially the children. How were they? Children of the same all over the world. We found then and, and, and since then. But uh, I remember one of, the, one of the several places we were based was Nobuyoka on the eastern coast, small town. And those, those school children would come, come up to the Marines uh, after their school day and, and say they were learning English, being taught English. And one of them said, I am a Nobioka schoolboy. They learned that today, you see. They were, I, I think it's true of the nature of the Japanese, as, as victors, uh, they were overbearing cruel uh, as as losers very very subservient we had little little trouble with them so I learned a number of Japanese phrases uh, very little interaction with the Japanese because we still were pretty well hands off of, uh, of, uh, of the duty we didn't the first couple of months we had patrol duty, as I said, all over southern Kyushu. After that, there was just boredom, very little interaction with Japanese uh, until the very end. And of course, MacArthur did it, even though he was not held in the highest regard by Marines. Uh, except since then, I've, I've learned that he did a marvelous job help writing the new constitution Japan, and uh, uh, really was really beneficial to the, the Japanese recovery, which he should have done, I think. Why was he not held in high regards? Uh, the Marines call him Doug Out Doug. Uh, I guess I guess that b because uh, he, uh, in many eyes, he just deserted his troops off of the time off of a corregidor, but he, he was ordered to, he was ordered to. And then as a veteran of Iwo Jima, how did you feel or 
How did you, what did you think when you heard about the atomic bombs? Well, we heard, you know, scuttle, scuttlebutt, you've heard that term. I mean, it means wild rumors. Uh, right, right after the uh, uh, Hiroshima bomb, word bounced all over camp that our Air Corps had dropped some, some kind of a new super bomb on uh, one of the Japanese cities called Hiroshima. Didn't know anything about it. Super bomb. And then three days later, the same rumor around in another southern island, southern uh, city in Nagasaki. And then we kind of held our breath and uh, two days later, surrender. We, we, we would have, we were ready to invade Japan that autumn. And they surrendered in August. And everything I learned after I got to Japan, I did a lot of reconnaissance and looking at the Japanese warehouses and so forth. They were ready for the, Amer for the invasion. All the way from trained troops, uh, it sandbagged airplanes, Few they had left, and they were even they even trained women and children uh, to attack the invaders with bamboo spears or anything they had. It would have been a slaughter on both sides, and I'm positive I would not have, I would not be here. And I felt that at that time uh, I was so extremely lucky not getting hit on Iwo Jima. I knew that I couldn't have the same luck twice. And most likely, I would not have. I would have been hit. Because we, our unit was to be one of the one of the front assault troops on Japan. Were you in training for that? Yeah, yeah. Replenishing, training the new, the old, the old troops, and the, and new replacements. Earlier, I. Uh, you spoke about, and I said we would get back to it, about the hidden injuries of war. Yeah. Um, and that topic is one, have you heard the phrase, war is hell? What? Have you heard the phrase, war is hell? Oh, sure. Uh, do you agree with that phrase? Of course. And how so? Uh, you know, the old saying, you might have heard this, uh, 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 a Marine uh, said that uh, died in St. Peter, uh, he said he deserves to go to heaven because he spent 30 days on hell on Iwo Jima. Uh, it, it, it was something that, some, that no one that really hasn't experienced, has not experienced combat duty, uh, can really understand. But it was hell and the um, in, the, in the extreme imagination, I guess. I don't know what uh, hell's be like. I don't expect to be there. But uh, uh, you couldn't, in your imagination, could not imagine anything worse than Iwo Jima. Although most of us, most of us held up emotionally. Without necessarily getting into all the details unless you want to since you were there and you said that you can't imagine it unless you were there try to tell me as best as you can what it was like what it was like and how was that experience uh it was you know most of us even the young kids like me had been anticipating the war lasted long enough to be fighting in the war, Army or Navy or uh, Marine Corps. Uh, and we read all kind of war movies, some uh, valid, some accurate, some inaccurate. But we, we knew what generally what to expect. Uh, but still it was a, a shock to many of them seeing all the blood and guts uh, and the continuous pounding of mortars and so forth, and seeing other men die right in front of you, right around you. Uh, 
it was much more intense than we had expected, but it wasn't a complete surprise to us. And most of most of us handled it pretty well. Fortunately, I never cracked up, but I, as I said before, I, I knew uh, several men that did. And I don't, there's no way there's any of them under suspect of being um, faking it. The term cracked up, is that one that you created, or is that, is that a phrase that was used by everybody back then? I think, no, no, it, it was a common term. Okay. Battle, battle fatigue, it's, it's when, I think, the, the person is under such extreme pressure, mental pressure, uh, that the mind just snaps, either momentarily or permanently. And uh, they had to act, act the way that I described some of these men that I helped back to the aid station shaking and, and sobbing and unable to really to move and uh, had to be led back to the aid station. They couldn't have made it by themselves. And, uh, and, it, and it was understandable. We all understood and were thankful that uh, we understood how they felt and were thankful that it hadn't happened to us yet. Did you experience or suffer any trauma from the war? Before, or after, or during, or when? During. No. And a afterwards? No. No. Oh. Uh, you hear, you hear um, all the, uh, what's the term? Uh, that, the, the terms that so many in Afghanistan and Far East. PTSD? Uh, troops. It's pretty common to have post traumatic stress post -traumatic, disorder. Yeah. We didn't know that term. I never had any post-traumatic term. I was, we all were, we came back home and forgot, tried to forget about the war and went to school. I did whatever we were supposed to, we normally did. Uh, but uh, I'm sure there were a number of them that, 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 that I didn't know of any that had uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome. And you didn't have any cracking symptoms? Huh? You didn't have any of the cracking symptoms? No, not, 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 not during, uh, I've been terrified many times. You, you lie flat on your face. I was pretty good, I was like an amoeba. I flowed out on the terrain. You want to get as low as you could while shells crashed all around me. Uh, and many experiences, like the two that I've mentioned, uh, happen every day. I figured that I tried to add it up. I don't didn't keep count of every time the near miss, but I figured adding so many per day that there were about 800 near misses I went through. Figuring. Uh, uh, but not, maybe more than that, figuring about 50 a day on the average of shells coming close, bullets popping close. Times 37 grenades, days. Grenades thrown at you. And the people that cracked up, how, what would be the percentage of people you saw that did that, your, your comrades? Because I didn't know. To, I, I didn't know the count, but I would, I would estimate that uh, uh, not over 2%, I would, I would estimate. Maybe way off, but it, it wasn't a high percentage. We, did, we didn't know uh, uh, that we were supposed to crack up. <laughs> Nowadays, it's a common experience, you know, but we didn't, we didn't know that. Many of us did. I, I didn't. Uh, but it wasn't something that we were, could accept, the possibility of that. Did you ever suffer from fatigue while in combat and in your service? Uh, we were always 
you never got enough sleep. In that sense, we were tired most of the time, but I don't think it affected our, our functioning. Um, the emotional stress, apprehension, is tiring. But that's about the extent of it, that in lack of sleep. And that, that would be the fatigue that I would focus on, the emotional, ongoing, never-ending apprehension of bullets and bombs. Did that grow on you after 37 days? I don't think so. Uh, those were, it was a continuous growth, the ones that cracked up, which I still think was a very small percentage. But uh, many times I thought I was gonna be hit under a barrage or rifle fire, but I don't think it built up in me. You ever get nervous, like extreme nervousness or jitters while in the field? Uh-uh. That's not that I remember. How about extreme shock of what you're seeing? The carnage, the gruesomeness, the, the just... It was real sad. You, uh, uh, you see, uh, most of the time, you saw very few dead Japanese especially the first several weeks. You saw many dead Marines, and that was demoralizing. Jeff would uh, pull their dead back in their caves at night. And uh, so that very few Japanese for us to see. For the latter part of the battle, they were lying around, along with maybe more Marines, but most of them died, I think, uh, Japanese in their what about, did you ever experience guilt? Somebody dying next to you or somebody maybe you could have saved or did that ever hit you? Uh, I don't think so. The guilt I felt was what I mentioned earlier. Uh, I felt a little guilty not being hit when everyone else was being hit either killed or wounded. Uh, but I was still extremely happy that I wasn't. I, don't, I, never, I never wished I would get hit. <laughs> but I, uh, I did feel a little guilty at the time. Now there are some people that have that experience and go to a different level. So they're never hit, but then they become kind of immune to it all and say, hey, better him than me. And they, it doesn't even affect them when they see people falling around them. Did that ever happen to you? I never felt that way. Never felt better him than me. No. The guy was, you know, he got hit, got killed, and I didn't. I may be next. But I never felt glad he was hit, not me. Never felt that way. I don't think most other Marines felt that way either. What about hypervigilance? Being very aware of loud noises and movements and things at, like that. At night, you had to be awfully careful. We had, um, most of the time, we had mainly from, from the 81 millimeter mortars, the, the flares, the parachute flares. We fired up, float down, right up the area. Uh, many of the ships offshore would send up flares, parachute flares. Uh, most of the time, they kept the place lit up, which kept the jet movement down to some extent. Once or twice, either they ran out of flares or got tired of firing flares up. There's no light, and that's when that's when you really get a little spooky. When it's totally dark and uh, a jet could be crawling right toward from your hole with you. I know one, once the guy, the, the company commander and I, this young second lieutenant, were in our, in our hole and uh, we heard a, a, a pop at the bottom of the hole, like, like a hand grenade that pops when it arms itself. And both of us dove out of the hole. 
And what it was, some one of our own men that thought we were jets, and they're throwing in a parachute, a um, um, a flare grenade, which burned up the lieutenant's blanket, and that made him mad. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, "I almost shot you guys when you came out of the hole." And the lieutenant kind of cussed him out a little bit. But that's typical. That was that was not unusual. And um, did any of your experience from the war um, affect you on your return home? No, I remember the only time I, I felt uh, uh, spooked. We went to shortly after I went to you know, went to the University of Richmond. I went to a football game in September or October, and they had fireworks going in between half or before the game started. And they were all over the sky. And I did, I started hollering, knock it off, you know, and it's a little spooky. Written Richmond. Other than that, I don't, I don't know of any uh, real reactions to the, uh, the war after that. So it was only that one time? The memories, of course, would never go away, but they, they, they fade, uh, but never go away. Then you've seen many things I'm not going to talk about. See. And the, the firework episode was only one time? Huh? The firework episode was only one time? So, as far as I remember, yes. And did you ever have any bad dreams about your experiences? No, I didn't. A lot of guys, they, uh, I assume you hear about guys that have bad, if, if, their, if their wife jars them at night, they come up swinging their fists. And uh, that's why the wife wouldn't let them have a knife on the table next to them. A lot of them, you know, reaction to a, the enemy until they woke up, unless they wanted to kill their wife. <laughs> <laughs> Most of them didn't. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't anyway. <laughs> she wanted to kill me a few times. <laughs> <laughs> we were not married. <laughs> Is there anything from your experience from the war that affects you today? Um, I feel um, I, I feel glad that I was able to participate in the war. Always been, you might say, proud of having been a Marine on Iwo Jima in World War II. Uh, I think it gave most of us the experience of uh, a feeling of patriotism more than, certainly more than the typical young man today is. Uh, but most of us, Went to school, went to work, started started a life after the war, and uh, I guess I guess as a group we built we built America's economy and back came back to normalcy normalcy pretty pretty quickly became uh, uh, super uh, CEOs uh, good loyal workers. Uh, and generally, I think, probably better citizens than we would have been if we had not been in the war, not participated in the war. And what did you do after the war? Went to school um, in, in Richmond, North of Richmond. Uh, later, uh, met this young lady and uh, married her. Uh, Worked in a, with an insurance company, and for 38 years I was uh, with insurance companies and in, in the group insurance area, and wound up as a, with, with several companies. Wound up as as a senior vice president with a company in Jacksonville, Florida, where we lived for the last 30, 32, 31 years before we moved to Atlanta area about a year and a half ago. So we had, I think, a normal life after that. 
I think that's typical of most veterans. Is there anything that you would like to add that I didn't ask you today? Um, no, except I, not that, that I have, haven't mentioned, I would really hope, I would wish that the current generation were more patriotic. Uh, there are many things they politically and socially that they can be ashamed of, I think. But that, that might be the evolution of, of a country's development, I don't know. But uh, by and large, my impression is that the younger generation uh, have a, less of a feeling of responsibility to their country. Not to obey the politicians, but to their country. And that's what I would like to see change. And is there anything that you would like to tell future generations now that you have the opportunity to do so? Uh, I'm talking to future generations. I'm talking about my great-grandchildren, six great-grandchildren. Just what I've, what I've mentioned. Um, uh, what they learn, uh, cling to their faith, uh, let their faith strength, strengthen, uh, try to be good citizens, uh, work hard, uh, and be responsible for your actions. Do all that, uh, you'll have a good life. It sounds like a recipe for success. Pardon me? Sounds like the recipe for success. It does, I think. Got examples right here. Uh, <laughs> all three children, the, the, other, the other child, the oldest, is, uh, was a doctor up in North Carolina. All, all three good citizens. Right? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> well, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to speak with me today. And thank you, Pat. Thank you for serving our country. Thank you. Thank you.